Oh, you need to know, this is Humanistic 2 Carl Tape. We are rolling. Good morning. We are here. We are present. We are now. To quote, hello, sorry, I know, hate to interrupt. Sorry, you want to finish then? No. <laughs> okay, two quick kid quotes of the week. <laughs> Interviewing this kid who um, suddenly is picked up by mom and there are a monitor in the car, a supervisor, which is totally unexpected to him. And he comes home with a bunch of monitors. The line I love, he said, and one of them had the face of a serial killer. <laughs> like, what? The face of a serial killer. Okay, wow. Wow, okay. From the world, of the world through the eyes of a child. Second quote, love this one. New little boy I'm seeing. And as they're walking out, the mom says, we'll say goodbye to Dr. Volcani. And he looks and says, he's not a doctor, he's Playman! <laughs> I love that! Playman! I mean, can't you see the cape and the, the PM right there? Playman! Oh, it was so good. Thank you. Thank you, little pumpkin. <laughs> Playman. All right. Okay. Did you guys practice? Did you practice? Come on, you practiced. I see. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Because that's really important. We're going to do a lot today around that. Talked about play helps you attend. It's the neurobiological substrate of human competence, including attending, like you're doing right now. It is the root in many ways of abstract reasoning, because the kid knows it's not really a shark. It's an abstraction of sharks. So you're starting to develop that abstract reasoning ability that's so uniquely, well, actually animals do do some abstract reasoning, but it does uniquely uh, position us in a phylums of existence. Um, it is the substrate in many ways of empathy because they really feel for these little figures. They'll help little Bambi. They identify with these little fingers. Remember that every little thing they play with is one way or another an aspect of self. Give me three adjectives to describe this. Dark, plastic, sun. Okay. Well, wait, no, actually, and what's your association to dark? Uh, just this. No, no, within, just give me some associations to the, to the concept of dark. Oh, uh, I, maybe I don't understand. Uh, associate to the word dark. Oh, associate to the word dark? Yeah. Um, uh, shade. Okay. Um, and shade is in comfort, shade is in... Uh, dark. Protection. Okay, protect, okay. Do you see how this goes? If you keep going, you're going to be talking about aspects of self and aspects of who you are and what you are and all that. And you just take a pair of sunglasses because we are symbol-making creatures. We are symbol-making creatures. We can't help but make symbols. The symbolic mode of reality. Obviously, when we get to Jung, we'll talk a lot about that. Everything is a symbol for something else. If you just go three steps into it, play by definition is those three steps into it. It's the three-dimensionality of the inner world of the child, obviously. Um, it is the causative mind. I really want you to watch that when we have the little pumpkins up here in two weeks. Yes, happy vacation to you guys. Pre-happy pre vacation next week. When we have the little pumpkins up here, just imagine what's going on, all the myelinations, all the stuff that's going on as they're trying to figure things out. They really are immersed in this activity that we misnomerizingly call play as if it's frivolity. It really is the roots of the causative man. How does this work? How does this happen? Um, it, is, it's a, it makes in many ways the unbearable palpable. Remember the little girl with the bathtub? Torture in the bathtub. It's an unbearable thing through her, what we call play, exploration of that reality that happened to her. The context, because it's make-believe, makes it palpable or tolerable. In that sense, it changes schema, whole mind schema. You can't really change schemas just through the left brain, prefrontal cortex. It has to be orbital frontal, all these other areas. You gotta have a different amygdala response, like her with bathtub. Ah, to ah, 
So you go from, ah, to, ah. Initially a symbol of torture, and then it became a symbol of soothing to her. Okay. In many ways, it solidifies the hardware wiring for joy. Kids have a lot of joy when they play. They giggle. They laugh. That's hardwiring for joy, the ability to have fun. Now, obviously, it's not the only thing. They giggle and laugh when all kinds of other things happen. But one of the things that's going on is that. And that's important to know. Oh, it's also really good because, I realize, and you'll see this, it fosters the ability to choose. They're making choices all the time as to what they do or don't like or what they are or aren't going to use. And sometimes they'll deal with such certainty. No, I don't want that. I want this. So one of the things you can reflect is, you really know what you want and don't want. And that will serve you well in life. When we talked about those various two main categories of feelings, mad, sad, glad, scared, and this feels right, this doesn't feel right, which is such an important, the inner wise one that says, yes, I should go to grad school, or no, I should stay with a bowling league. Yes, I should marry this person. No, I shouldn't. These are huge. Well, in many ways, the substrates of that is the ability to play and go, I want this to be here. I don't like that. Now, obviously, there's a lot of other contexts that do that. Play is an important one on that. Okay. Uh, we talked about humanism, humanistic approaches. What's the fundamental theory of the person? For humanism? Actualization. Self-actualization, all those Maslow hierarchy of needs. And the highest is to be all that we can be, actually. Actualize. As you know, if I look at those hierarchies, the fundamental substrate is to be connected. And that's why we will give up the primary need to, to exist for concepts like freedom and liberty. We are very principled people. There's also competence and mastery. The whole point from day one, I talked to you about trying to create a context that's psychologically safe, student-directed teaching. That's in order to evoke your competence and mastery motives and not your fear motive, fear-based performance motives. When I read you Kuala Lu, it's really important that, you, that your drive to self-actualize, to be competent and masterful, is evoked in the context of feeling psychologically safe. So never mind, as parents, to feel a little pumpkin. That's why punishment, which is the opposite of that, it will not evoke a sense of safety, is not a useful approach. You want your little pumpkin to feel like that? You want those in your life to feel like that? You want, if you're a teacher, your students to feel psychologically safe. So their competence and mastery motives are evoked. We talked about pathology from a humanistic point of view. Why is there pathology? What's their version of what the roots of pathology are? If we're all groovy and trying to strive for competence and mastery, and our fundamental nature is good to be kind, caring. Say a lot, or you can do it in stereo. That's good. Yeah. Harmony. Uh, unconditional, positive regard. regard. Yeah, well, the lack of that. Well, congruent. Congruent, genuine, unconditional positive regard. When you don't have that, what happens? When you don't have psychological safety, what happens? You become ashamed of certain aspects of yourself. That's it. That's exactly it. The disavowed self. You don't just become ashamed of it, you disavow it. You push it away. You say, that's not the not me. That's not me. I don't hit my brother, I'm not there. All these subtle cues we get in the socialization process. And that what we're thinking, feeling, fantasizing, wanting, desiring, experiencing is somehow bad. In that yum yuck continuum, that not prefrontal cortex, horrible old limbic sense of, therefore, I'm bad. That's a terrible feeling. The people are important in our lives, it's extremely important because we want to feel connected to have them value and validate us. But we think they only value and validate us if we're the way they want us to be. What happens to all the parts that aren't the way they want us to be? That's why it's so important that you can think, feel, say anything and do just about anything and I will value and validate you just as much as a valid human experience. There's no such thing as a not valid human experience. Doesn't mean you have to 
act out on it. But when you don't get that, and we all don't get that all the time, and we all make a mistake that, oh, therefore I'm not lovable, I'm not valuable, I will not be allowed to be connected, I'll be disconnected, and that's a feeling of shame. So that creates symptoms, whether that's anxiety, depression, aggression, all kinds of symptoms come out of that in this theology, psychotheology. So the solution, the healing, is... Somebody hasn't said anything today. What's the solution in this model? What heals? Acceptance. Correct. And a certain kind of acceptance. Congruent, genuine, unconditional, positive regard. It's kind of tautological, isn't it? If this creates the problem, then this creates the solution. Take the, the dis out of it, the non, and you do UPR congruently and genuinely, and voila! You become unimonic. Because really what they're talking about is my little term about unimon. I, kick, I am feeling in this moment acceptance of the totality of who I am. Thoughts, feelings, I get it, I get it. I'm, cons I'm congruent with myself. I'm not self-alienated. That's why it's an existential philosophy all about the disavowedness as alienation. And now I'm no longer alienated. I'm congruent with myself. I'm unimonic. Unimonic. You have a question or a comment? Yeah, I was wondering, like, so when a child who lacks the genuine, um, unconditional positive regard and receives that in a role from a therapist, and yeah. how long, I know it's probably going to be different for every child, but how long does it actually take for that to actually kind of, um, not necessarily sink in, but the child to be able to, to have that reflected, that positive regard reflected back and where they start you know, incorporating Internalizing. That's yeah. a fabulous question. 3.8 minutes. I have no idea. <laughs> it's exactly 3.8 minutes. No, it gets even more complicated because they can have a discongruent feeling about feeling incongruence. Because what does that mean about the other people in their lives who are treating them in different ways, perhaps? And again, it's not an accident that some kids will say this is better than Disneyland, coming to your office and, seeing, and being treated in such a fashion. But then we would rather say I'm bad than to say the caregivers are bad in some ways. It's a very complicated thing. But the premise is, and, it's, and it is in many ways true, in this moment, in this existential here now moment, when I feel this way in this human relationship, that I really see that this person really does genuinely care about me, no matter what, that's an amazingly freeing moment. And it adds in those, all these various aspects of self, now the compassionate one for the self. So theoretically, one could even say, I know to oneself, I know you feel scared around mom, dad, or whatever. I can understand that you have that feeling. That's okay too. In a weird way, it's kind of mindfulness. Any feeling, a little leaf on the river that floats by, that's okay too. So it builds the wise one. But it feels incredibly good. I told you about Barry Graff. Right? I told you I had two supervisors when I was doing my postdoc. One was Katie Francesca, at least in terms of my classwork, so to speak. She was the, and it still is, a MMPI Rorschach, very uh, analytic in that sense person. And Barry Graff was a true, true humanist. Remember, you remember his diagnosis to every client he saw? <laughs> Human being, you'll never forget it. Human being. He, it was amazing to be around around him because he really treated you in that moment just that way and initially it was a little almost creepy until you realized it was truly genuine mm -hmm. it wasn't a facade it wasn't a prime humanistic therapist I see that guy it tickles your pink doesn't it? it it wasn't it really was who he really was it's like wow and you felt extremely present with him in that moment like that's all there was right now in this moment is I'm not idealizing him I'm sure, I'm sure he farted and did other things we didn't talk about setting limits, about farting and boogers. That happens in child therapy. But, he, um, but there's that sense, the quality, and it was an amazing thing. I told you one of my most memorable moments with my dad, ever. Wonderful man, 
professor looks at Einsteinian, but he's a man of the left brain for the most part, though very few. When he looked at me, because I was breaking up with a girlfriend, I said, oh my, oh honey, you're in such pain. And he was so caring in that moment, I felt so embraced. So it's really true, but who knows how, when and how that gets absorbed. So that gets us to what we like and don't like about the theory. One of them is, it's so groovy to think in an instant I can totally change how I see myself on that yum yum continuum. I can embrace who I am and change how I feel. On the other hand, oh my God, it, take, it could take forever to change that schema of self and really make that fundamental shift can take a really long time. It's not a skill-based approach at all. In fact, the purists, some of them will be mortified by how I try to mix it. I do a lot of skill-based, skill acquisition stuff. Three in, five out, having kids on my floor with teddy bears in their belly, learning to breathe, that's not a humanistic approach. That's teaching them a skill. From this model, they, they already have all those skills. They'll figure it out. Just be with them in this way. But it can take a really long time. And who's, never mind whether insurance runs out, but parents' patience runs out. He's not changing, she's not changing that she's still biting me in the leg and kicking kids at class. Now, I've sent you literature that says, there's a lot of studies that say, hey, it really can work, and it can work within 12 sessions or so. And it works even better if you include the parents. As you know, I really do say repeatedly it's a team approach. The funny thing, a parent the other day said what I always say, and that's, you know, you ought to have t-shirts that says Team Albert. I said, I can't believe you said that. I just want to think I'll say that. I want to have t-shirts for each of the kids. And we're really a team here, working that. Um, by the way, did I, and I hope you click the links. I sent you t two things about just play in the world. One where it's about stairs that are like pianos. It's a link. It's really cool. And there's another one about trash can. It's about how... Click on the link. I know you guys are busy. I know life is full of other things to be doing than this little YouTube clip. If you can transform the moment into play, you have opened up the magic mind, the creative mind, the open heart, and it's a different way. I told you about the eggs. I was about to set the room on fire, the house on fire. We ended up in an egg war and washing each other's hair. You transform the moment into a whole different experience. The amygdala, remember, 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 when you're in amygdala mode, you can't see, if you usually see your fingers out here, you can't see, you literally cannot physiologically see your fingers out here because it's so narrowing a perspective. Great on the savanna 30,000 years ago with a big tooth tiger coming at you. Not great in human relationships most of the time. Unless you're under really physical threat, it doesn't do you good to get. And I teach my clients that I was working with a couple yesterday. I said, whoa, you're getting amygdalitis. Your focus is going to be like this. And you're going to get, what are you going to get? Defensive, critical, contemptuous, or withdraw. Just watch. I want to have like little pads. D, you're being defensive right now. Whoa, wait a minute, contemptuous. Whoa, hold it. That's adding to the prefrontal cortex. The compassionate observer is able to say, wait a minute. Three in, five out. Pull, pull back, let's move into play mode. Can we giggle here somehow? Remember the, the, the solution to the unresolvable conflicts between all of us is compassion and humor, wit, playful, magic, mindful, flip it around, be open. Okay? So relationships heal, so, but the problem is it can take a long time. The other, we listed some other problems. It's ahistorical, it's here now. When we get to analysis, psychodynamic approaches, they'll spend four or five sessions just getting the background history. On the one hand, that's cool, that's very respectful because they want to create a huge data bank to make these interpretations. So on one hand, that's really cool. On the other hand, wow, I barely can get a parent to come in one time to give me background information, never mind four, and they want the parent's background, whatnot. Well, this is a historical. You're here now from the minute you come into the room. And when a kid comes in, I don't ask them about their family. I'm here right now with them. You're looking at the play. You're looking at all the toys. You're wondering what you can do. And you know, I'm here now with you. And that's all that matters. On the one hand, that's groovy. On the other hand, it's like, huh? Same approach for every diagnosis. 
here now, genuine, unconditional, congruent, positive regard for everybody. And you remember Rogers was a um, research guy, first one to do outcome studies, as far as I know, with his Q sword. And he says, it doesn't work for schizophrenia. It's not going to cure a schizophrenic, but might help them feel a little less alone in their aloneness. But it's not going to cure it. But OK. It's really hard to do. It's really hard to honestly, pheromonally, twinkle in the eyelid, be genuinely, unconditionally positive regard for everybody in every moment. Oh my God. I have a hard time with anchopredics, but especially when they sit in my office or stand and go, Aah! and then they want to be held. I remember a kid did that. And I remember, do you know, in this moment, I'm having a hard time being genuinely, congruently, unconditionally positive regarding. He was like, ooh, and it smelled. Oh. Sorry. Real world, these are kids. <laughs> they do do the booger thing. They like to do the booger thing. Here is, I know it's fun for you when you will just spin it around and twiddle. I get it. I told you to get it. Kleenex. Thank you. Ew. The farting, I don't care so much, though. I do have a little door right there. You can open the door, put your booty out, <laughs> fart out there. Closed door. Thank you. I know it's fun. You like to do things that you're not supposed to do in school. Oh, my God. It is very hard to be in that kind of mode with everybody at all times. I have evaluated two murderers. One was a teenager, juvenile hall. I go there. He was, he was 16. He was walking past his friend's house, and he doesn't even know why. He suddenly turned, went to the door. The mom answered it, and he butchered her. I don't know how else to say it. He had a knife, and he doesn't know why. He was in a totally dissociated state. Horrible stuff. Horrible story. And you read this stuff, and you think it's CSI. It's not. This is real life. All these reports, police reports, and the interviews from each person's perspective. And oh my god. See, that's my wife's world that I could never live in like that because of this. But the point of all that is he talked to me. He got interested in the evaluation process. And I started, because I do interview him historically. His dad, of course, would take him, he had braces, punch him in the mouth, and then put him up in front of the mirror as blood coming down from his mouth, and says, see, don't fuck with me. Not a lot of unconditional positive regard from that man. So I asked him once, this kid, as to, does he have any unusual thoughts or images? Or, he goes, you know, when I go to sleep at night, right before I go to sleep, I'll never forget this phrase. I see this huge grimacing, his word, huge grimacing mouth at the end of my bed. That's all I saw. Huge grimacing mouth. Talk about part object. The point of that is, I actually end up having unconditional genuine regard, at least in moments, for this kid who butchered this woman, and by the way, had sex with her after she was dead. And when the puppies, there were a bunch of puppies in the house, came and started licking the blood, not to be gory, that's when he kind of snapped out of it. In fact, he went to the door and said to her, and he doesn't know why I said this, there's your, one of your dogs is dead and his mouth, he's bleeding, bleeding from his mouth. Analysts would love this kind of dissociative chain links to his dad beating. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how that mind works. But the point really of this story, and we'll fill the day with lots of light. I'm not going to leave you in this dark place. By the way, that's why I stopped. Two was enough. I can't live in that dark thing. I don't even watch CSI. I don't go for all that dark stuff. Though I do like Homeland. There's some places. And I'm looking now at this Viking thing. Anyway, you can have unconditional positive regard in a moment, even for a serial killer. Well, he wasn't serial, he was a killer. But it's extremely hard. And you have to do a lot of your own shadow work or de-shadowing your own stuff. Because what we don't like in others is what's within us. It's our disavowed selves. OK. So then we talked about technique. I should give you space. Any comments, thoughts, questions? So, yes. It's frustrating like the case that you presented where I wonder if things would have been different for him had he received that, but you know, earlier than, oh, you know, God. like it's just, it's frustrating to see because he's probably not the only person that's gone through that, and Correct. it's kind of like it's, it's just frustrating, you know, that that has to happen, and no one's able to kind of have been in his life earlier, and maybe things would have been different. Absolutely. Well, and the other thing for me, <laughs> I, I mean, 
the treatment plan is called prison. I mean, this, there's no way out of that. This guy's going to prison. He's 16. How long is he going to be there? 10 years, 15 years? So he's out at 31. One might imagine that those, let's say, 15 years in prison weren't filled with a lot of congruent, <laughs> genuine, unconditional positive regard. So one might imagine this kid with all of that now coming out into the world. Oh, OK. So I, would, I thought about exactly that question. What experiences could he possibly have now, never mind the past, that would make it different? And what I realized, though this wasn't going to happen, he loved and was very good at football. And he respected football players. If he could have a coach who was who had been a former NFL or you know, a big guy, strong guy, good, but has a heart and has a twinkle in the eye for this kid, I'm getting moved by this. And he could have 15 years of that, it would be different. He would come out a different person, I believe. Now, let me also be clear. My good buddy and sweet mate, Jeff Warren's good buddy, brilliant neuroscientist at UCLA, studies the brains in very great detail of serial killers along with schizophrenics and other folks. And as I've told you, whether it's epigenesis or genetics or all mutations, epigenesis is a form mutation in a way, their brains are different. So there are those, and I know epigenesis also means in relationships, Siegel and otherwise, thank you for that nice DVD. Um, right, the brains can't be changed in relationship, but I also will say sometimes they cannot. And you've got a hard wiring problem. And you can love somebody with diabetes all you want. It's not going to take away their diabetes. To use a kind of silly example, but, but who knows? It certainly won't happen without that, not very likely. Okay. So then, I operationalized for you, and we practiced being this way. Your role of the therapist is you're a mirror with heart. You're a mirror with heart. You mirror back to the child. What are you mirroring back to the child? Yes, basically what they're doing. I had to do it with each other. And of course, you become immediately paranoid. Your amygdala fires like, what is this person doing, reflecting everything? I'm getting paranoid. Every step you take, you're going to feel paranoid. You do it with a kid, and it's magic. It's a human hammock. You've just embraced them. Oh my god, I'm finally being seen. I'm going to write myself a little reminder of something. What else do you, what's the next thing? Or not, it's not in any kind of order, I just try to do it. Correct. This is not the black box. This is outside the black box. This is really what you see is what you get. I see you're moving your finger across what we would call a screen. Though it could be up, anything you want in here, it's up to you. Especially in the beginning, by the way, when you're with these little pumpkins, that's a lot of what you say. What's this? Well, it's usually seen as a marker, but in here it can be anything you want that's totally up to you. That's up to you in here. That's up to you in here. That's up to you in here. You define reality. This is purple. The world sees as a black in here. It's purple because that's up to you in here. You define reality. All I care about is your definition of reality, not anybody else's. That's what matters in here. This is not a school to teach you the names of the colors. Not that you shouldn't know the names of the colors. You should. It helps you feel connected to the world around you. Hello? Ideation. What's your thinking? What your attitudes are? Beliefs that are implied in your actions. Looks like it's important for you to learn because you seem to be paying attention. So it seems like it's important for you. So even though in a way this is kind of the most amorphous, hardest to kind of define, in many ways it's almost the most pervasive one that you're going to reflect on because it is so pervasive. Once you get the nuances of what it means, it's a lot of what's in here. Ideation. What's the next one? Yeah. That's right. Feelings. The one you're most familiar with. You look happy, man. Sad, glad, scared. All those nuances of feelings. <laughs> now, I didn't have you practice because there wasn't time. Remember this one? Interpretation. 
Humanists aren't really huge about interpretation. From whence the aboveth cometh. Right. You're looking at me, seems like you're paying attention. Um, now you're starting to smile a little bit, maybe you're feeling a little amused, maybe a little put on the spot. Maybe it reminds you long ago you were in third or second grade and you remember all of a sudden, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I'm not going to put you away on the spot. Mm -hmm. That would be an interpretation, right? That the present relates to something in the past, I'm going to make that link. It can be wonderful when you do it accurately and correctly. It is the bedrock of analytic, as you well know. Analytic work is to interpret what makes the unconscious will be conscious, where there was it, there's ego, that whole concept. By the way, they would call all of this interpretation. Just that I say you're now looking at me, they would say that's an interpretation. They kind of label everything that. I call that a reflection, but okay. What's the not so good news, if you want to put it that way, in terms of interpretation? In terms of kids, little pumpkins, until we're six or eight. It's difficult to match to where they are, their developmental level. Neuro hard wiring, myelination has not occurred to the point where they can do that kind of abstract reasoning. They're in magic mind. That's the other very, very, very important thing about play that we said. It's their primary way of connecting with self, other, and the world. You get to co-narrate the, 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 the script of their lives, their poem, the symphony of their lives. You get to co-narrate. They're not in that Piagetian cognitive state of being able to do that level of abstract reasoning. Especially if they're feeling anxious and now their amygdala went this way. So when you say to a kid, you're hitting that bear, maybe you feel like hitting me or maybe it reminds you of your brother that you want to beat up. Usually, not always, but usually one of three things happen. They immediately stop doing what they do. They say no. Or they just keep on going until they ignore you. I've never had a kid, I really haven't heard of a kid turn around and say, oh my God. Never occurred to me. That's brilliant. I feel so embraced. And so I've now integrated that aspect of myself. I hate my brother, and that's okay. I've never heard, I've never heard that ever happen. I don't make, mean to make fun of that, but... And I told you about Melanie Klein and her amazing interpretations. I think the kid just thinks, you're nastier than I am, so I must be okay. Ah, I want to have your baby. I want to be inside your womb. Wow. And then what, what is it that I do? I'm not saying I'm the only one that does it, but I've really kind of thought about it. Tradeologist, all that stuff we've talked about in terms of being a good parent, I believe you've got to do mega-wise in terms of being a good therapist with children. Tradeologist, all oh, just. You're a tradeologist. I really want you to start paying attention that kids in your own and everybody's actions have an implied trait underneath it. And look for those ones that are useful at 30. And you can start with the big seven. Remember the seven traits that they found in that article, in that research? Do you remember those? One of them is an attitude of gratitude. Right? Grit. Self-control. Self-control, social savviness, optimism. I always miss one. Curiosity. And curiosity. Zest. Curiosity zest. and zest. Kids will show all those. Underscore them. You have a, I did that just yesterday, and this new kid will come in. Oh, God, was she a charmer. And at the end, she didn't want to leave, so she started kicking and screaming. It's quite interesting. <laughs> I know you want to be here. I'm so glad you want to be here. I can see you don't want me to touch. I see you don't want to leave. I actually did have to get, the parents were in the room. It was the first session, and the two moms. And I did have them removed, because I didn't want her to feel like, who was this weird guy touching me? But they were like, oh, God. And she's like, yeah. Yay for your marvelous, spunky spirit. I'm gonna, <laughs> we're all going to help you be in charge of that marvelous, spunky spirit. But I did say to her, oh, my gosh, you have a, at one point, she was just so wondering about things. You have a marvelously inquisitive mind, huge word, which means you want to learn about everything you possibly can, and that will serve you well in life. Be observant. It's happening. Your little pumpkin's already showing it. It's already being curious about things and wondering. Tenacity, grit, 
grit is tenacity under adversity. Even though it's hard, I'm still going to stick with this. Oh my God, that's how you got to where you're sitting right now. You are tenacious. Every one of you have grit. Optimism. The world is a marvelous, wondrous place. Now, I'm not going to say that in contradiction to their media experience, because I'll first echo their media experience, but it'll be in there somewhere, because they will see it. You have a great capacity for joy. They'll giggle and laugh, and you'll say, ah, you have a great capacity for joy. You just feel such joy. That'll start you out. Well. OK, you getting this? You look at your little golden retriever or whatever, you look at the traits they events. Again, it's easier to do this stuff with our pets than with our, with our personages. And you've got to practice this. You've got to practice this like any other skill. What's the 10,000 hour rule or 10,000 time rule? You have to do something 10,000 times before you get good at it. I don't know if I'm my 10,000th catch of this pen. Oh, I'll miss that one. <laughs> See how your mirror neurons went all oh, boo hiss? Ah, oh, that was better. Yeah, it felt better. Competence and mastery built in, and it makes you feel connected. And that's what all this does when you are doing this with them. They feel connected, so they feel psychologically safe, so their mastery and competence, motivation, being all they can be, happens. Okay, who is going to get in contact with their inner brave one? Oh, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to move that camera up here. Um, because the cord is going. Okay, okay, ready? Thank you for doing this. During our time together, I'm going to demonstrate for you all these things. During our time together, you can think, feel, say absolutely anything, and do just about anything. Side footnote, just to make life a little easier, we're going to use this. Okay. <laughs> you can do it with it, make life easier. Okay, and I'm just going to be here with you. Okay. And you're looking at that, and you're looking at. Looks like you're trying to figure out how to open it. Looks like you're thinking very intensely. How in the world does this thing open? And it looks like you like to do things on your own. You're very independent. And you figured it out. And look at that look of surprise. Footnote, notice where I'm sitting. I am sitting, you're going to freeze frame for a second. Not literally, but I am sitting so I can see her face. What I'm mostly doing is watching her face. I'm not over here. Though a lot of times I will be, but not. Also, I want to make sure I know what's going on. And the way to do that is to look at the face. Okay, so I'll do some traditional for about three minutes, then I'll add some other things that we'll talk about, then we'll do more. You've discovered all those things, and you're like, huh, what am I going to do first? Mm -hmm -hmm. You're, you're, you know what you like and don't like, because you're like, I don't want those. Mm, maybe that one. And maybe this one. And you're very thorough. You're looking very carefully. That will serve you well. Like, oh, you're picking that one out. I don't label that. That's a radio, but it's up to her. If she says radio, I'll say radio. I didn't. You're picking that out. Now, that's obviously a dog, so I typically go woof, woof. And then I look at the face immediately to see how they react when I bark. And then I'm going to go up on the horse. I'm going on the horse, mm, said the horse. Mm, the horse is bouncing all around. Mm, the horse is going right on the bed. Oh, I get to be the dog. Woof. Okay, footnote, pause. One of the other things I do a lot of is I join in the play. Bimonic space. I'm already starting to feel a little bimonic with her. I'm actually moving into that space. I'm going to have you guys bark and meow and move right into play mind. A lot of the traditionalists of the humanists will stay back and kind of more reflect, reflect, reflect. There are those, like myself, who will join right into this. Because I'm not just going to watch you play music, I'm going to join with you. You're the lead. I'm rhythm guitar in the background. If you tell me to do a little lead, I will. And I might throw in a lead and see how you like it or not. Because this is a co-authorship if I'm in tune with you. Because we're bimonic. I get it. But the ability to go, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, oh boy, oh, oh, looks like we're on an adventure now. But you see, I even now reflexively look at the face. Because I got to make and she's smiling, so I'm OK. Because if she's like, whoa, you're being weird. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll stop and you'll go, boy, that was weird. I could see you thinking, oh, boy, that guy's really weird. What is he barking for the dog for? It looked like it scared you a little bit, so I'll back out of that. I can't remember the last time a kid in any way thought that was weird. They're usually like, oh, fantastic. You speak please, huh? Yeah, okay. We're on it. 
we are on it. We are bimonic. We feel connected. And all can that. This represents an aspect of self. Remember all those traits? We can say it about this. Boy, are you a brave dog. Yes, I'm a brave dog. I can see that. You're willing to take on big tasks. Yes, I am. Even you. Wow. That is, look at those little chunky thing. Huge power. It's not how big you are. It's how big your spirit is. That's a hallmark. Okay? There's also what I call hallmarks. They're little wisdoms, little axioms that come out of what's happening. And one of the classics one is, the kid will be hurt and then they heal. And I'll say, God, it's such a drag. Sometimes we have to go through some pain in order to heal quick and then move on. And then we gain all that thing from the pain. Well, that's kind of a hallmark in. And if you start watching play, there's a lot of little wisdoms that you can underscore. But you're talking, if this is represents an aspect of her, what I say about this is about her. So if I say, brave dog, took on the big, huge, ah, raptor, ah, brave. I'm talking about her. And she could internalize it in a way easier by dog than directly to her sometimes. Okay? One of the ones they love me to voice is I have, as I said, and it's not a, uh, it's a, it's not a bobo dog because it gets popped, but it's a punching bag, light enough that I can hold up. And they love it when I go, oh, God, you kicked me. Oh, you got me right in the noogies. Oh, oh. And if I don't make that sound and just reflect, boy, you're hitting it hard, they'll say, no, no, talk for it. Come on, be it. Here, be it. They'll hand it to me. Be it, be it. They want you to be bimonic with them, engage into that. Okay? So on top of all this, to make your life even more complicated, you move into the play and be one of the figures while you're still doing this about the figure. You can do hallmarks. There's also Greek chorus. Kind of staying from the outside. Roo, 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 said the dog as he was going on a great adventure into the dark forest to find the raptor. Okay? So you're standing by talking about what is going on in here. There's the child, there's the activity, there's the therapist. Focus on child. That's the other thing that happens. People get all lost in the activity. They're over here doing this and the kid's now somewhere else. <laughs> I know it's fun for you, but it's actually about the child being with them through the medium of play. Okay? By the way, it's thrilling and exhausting. I don't do more than three kids anymore in a row. I'm exhausted. Adults are intense, but there is some like me. <laughs> Someday I'll tell you I knew that I did. That was, but I came back. I really, really, really try to be present, 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 in the moment. And even though I might be going woof, woof, and all kinds of stuff, there's the prefrontal, there's the inner therapist that's going. This makes sense in this moment for this reason. If you pause me and said, "Why are you doing this now?" I will tell you why. I could be wrong. It might not be the best thing to be doing in this particular moment, but I'm doing it for a reason. If nothing else, is to be connected, because this is the most natural way for kids to connect, self, other, world. Back to the play we go. You're very adaptive and able to move in and out of these spaces. Hmm, now you're looking at that. Hmm, that caught your curiosity. Where, 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 where? You're rocking the little what looks like a baby. Where, setting up the chairs. Here comes that person, looks like a person. Mm-hmm. Wee, wee. Yeah, adventurous. Off I go, oh, clunk. But she gets right up and keeps on going. That doesn't get her down just because she fell. So that's a lesson about your fall. We get back up, that's resiliency. Wee, and now she's on the table. <laughs> Not using that. Ah. All right, trying to figure out how that's working. Whee! That one's going up. Being very, again, thorough. Just checking every little thing out. Oh, little puppy. Puppy's in with the baby. We're together. Yeah, it's nice to be together. Mm, flowers. Style. Looks like you're looking for just the right thing. Hmm. Hmm, a bottle. <laughs> we have an elective mutus. This is a really interesting... <laughs> <side>. <laughs> Most kids talk a lot. It's okay if you don't, though, by the way. You don't have to say a word in here. <laughs> it's just interesting. You go, hmm. So even though she hasn't said that that was a bottle, you still... Yeah, it looks so obviously as a bottle. A purist might not. I mean, I'm glad you got that. A purist might say, oh, you're putting that on there. It's up to you and you. Some things are so odd. You're like, come on. 
It's a bottle, it's a dog, it's a baby. And you can see how she's reacting to it. So it's kind of shorthand. But, and the other, oh, the other good news on this, you can keep going with that one. The other good news on this is they will correct you. That little pumpkin yesterday, I forgot what I said. But some, I was just doing a little reflection, she looked at me and no. And I went, fantastic. It, it was just like, you know, like, oh, you're putting this over there, no. Wow, fantastic. I'm glad it's important to you and you're willing to tell me that I got it wrong because I want to get it right. And it wasn't she was oppositional, I had to say no about everything. It, so they will do that. And I always get the, 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 there he goes, or it could be, or her, it's up to you. Because the gender thing, these are, these are kind of gender neutral, which is very smart of them. Not every one, but some of them are. You have a question. You keep going, because you might be more. It might be along the same topic. When you were mentioning like, the story between the dog and the raptor, how do you know exactly that the child identifies with the dog per se? Yeah, I don't. But I keep looking at the kid. And what kids usually do, they're like, it's like you're now telling a story in front of the campfire. They're like, now I don't go into a long one because I want their input. And they usually will input very quickly. They'll grab the dog and just start doing something. They'll pick it up. As but that's a great question. Story, like they'll grab something else and make No, no, they'll grab the dog. They'll, if, I, if I'm doing the dog yeah. raptor, I mean, I just kind of think that as an example, but I'm, because I want to show brave dog. That would usually have only been as a follow-up to what the kid's doing. I more want the kid to be doing that, but sometimes th there's an interlude for a moment. And it's almost like saying, I keep doing music analysis, here, you take the lead for a second. Oh, okay, but I'll take what I think is going on for them, and I'll watch them, and, and they, they will tell you if that's wrong, it really bugs them. No, no, it's not that. And I always thank them. That's so cool. You know what fits and doesn't fit for you, and you're willing to speak your heart. That will serve you well in life. And it does. It's amazing. This little moment, they're speaking their heart. No, it's this way. And an adult's willing to listen and change. Wow, cool. The real test of whether you're really hearing me is when we're disagreeing. When we're agreeing, it's easy. When we disagree, and you still hear me and honor me, and now you change? Wow. I'm a little kid. You're a big adult. Wow. Great question, though. Meantime, you're busy. You have a great ability to get totally absorbed in what you're doing. I do, and that will serve you well in life. Oh, oh, you're putting that on top of that. Yeah, you're wondering what that is. Yeah, what it's supposed to be, though, of course, in here can be anything you want. What it's supposed to be is kind of like the ashes on the fire. How hot. And it goes supposed to, but it's totally up to you, in here in the fireplace. But obviously you, with your marvelous creative mind, can put it in wherever you want. Mm, yeah. That, in, that intrigues you, big word. It means you're like, huh, I'm wondering about that. Interests you. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, it's a little Joey. Joey in the belly. Yes, in the little pouch. Boing, boing, boing. Mommy or daddy, it's totally up to you. Bouncing up way on the roof. A little mini adventure. And now they're back there in the you have a great ability to delight in the littlest of things. <laughs> That's another one. Kids do have a great ability to delight in the littlest of things. And that is such a gift. And you're evincing it by now, that part of you. And you do, remember, that part is in all of us. It's how to bring it up. Now you can put that up there, and that does look like a bed. And it looks like that bed's going to go over there. And, ah, you're wondering what that is, it looks like. It's supposed to be, though, I was in here, it's totally up to you. It's supposed to be a sink and an oven and some drawers for the kitchen. But of course, it's up to you. You can make it be whatever you want. It looks like you like to actually have it be the way it's supposed to be and use it that way. Yes, that's fine. Kid her age, at uh, what, 20 years? Uh, uh, tends to be a culturating kid at, at two, three, four. Very magic mind, right? When we get six, seven latency, culturation. It matters how it is they want to be more accommodating to the real world as opposed to assimilative putting their thing on that. What have I not done this entire time? And we could spend the rest of this class and I wouldn't do one time. What? Question. Ask her a question. Correct a mento. I'm not saying it's bad novel to ask questions. Of course not. When you do this modality, do not ask a question. We're going to see the Carl tape in a matter of moments. I think I sort of imply one question the entire time. I didn't need to imply that. Why do I not ask questions in this modality? Exactamento. It's a neurobiological shift. 
from the magic mind where we're being bimonic to now the prefrontal cortex when we're being separate. I'm not saying that's bad, but that's not what my intent is here. Yes? I was going to say, so my niece that I'm going to be bringing in in a couple weeks, she actually sees a play therapist, and I was talking with her parents the other day about it, and they also have the same rule where they don't ask her questions when she's playing because that's her time. Correct. It also changes, as you know, the hierarchy of the relationship. I'm now telling you, and and implyingly telling you the command of stop what you're doing, think, and answer my question. Right, like you're the expert. Yeah, and it changes the shift, the power shift in a way. Again, the only, in this kind of context, the only appropriate question theoretically would be if the kid <laughs> looks at you, like, it looks like you want me to ask you a question. What question would you like me to ask? Uh-huh. It's up to you in here. That <laughs> question. Okay? So do you do this for like the whole 45 minutes? I mean, I, can, I work with kids that are just so bored. I do know that their attention span with one house with lots of toys and then they want to go to something else. Right. Something else, you know, because they get bored or... Right. Figure out what else is in the office. Sure. No, I'll go. It's up to them. My office is replete with unbelievable amounts of stuff, including Sam World, which is wonderful. So they can just kind of. Oh, totally. It's up to them. You can think, feel, say anything, do just about anything. It's up to you. Now you like to go over here. You like to explore. You're very. Usually, like this little girl yesterday is what three or four. She has ridiculous night terrors where the parents are. She just screams and yells, and she's in this altar state. And anyway variety of things have shifted in her life. And she's all over that office. And she's very thorough. She wants to look at every little thing. And she's really into categorizing. Where does this go? So she asks me a question. I'll say it again. And, uh, it's up to you. And you're the, usually I put it over there. Well, she, she's starting to accommodate. So she wanted to put it in. But she also magic mind like crazy. But yeah, it's, and if they look bored, they look like you're a little bored. That's, that's rare. But there's pauses. It looks like you're not sure what to do right now. Again, now all that is ideation. It's up to you in here. I have no need. Now, if I have a wonderment, you'll see, oh, you, we probably won't have time today for this demonstration tape. I'll probably just email it to you. It's about a 15 minute, 15 minute tape that I did with a student's kids, just as a demonstration of this. And I do ask her a couple of questions. I ask whether it's a mom or what the figure was. Now, I could have instead just said, huh, I'm one like, like with this. Uh, I didn't know whether this was going to be a mom or whatnot. I don't know with a kangaroo whether it's a mom or a dad. You'd think because a baby's inside is a mom, but it might be a dad. I could simply say out loud, I'm wondering if that's a mommy or what. And I'm just putting it out there. She can answer or not. It's up to her. That's really not a question. It's just a, I'm wondering. Hmm, a mom or a dad? I'm not sure. Kid will answer if I want it. Is it that really important sometimes? If it's important. You had a comment or a thought. Um, I was just wondering, so for example, if the child seems bored without trying to ask them a question, would you just, for example, say, like, you seem bored, you can go ahead and choose something else. If you oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it looks like you're bored. You're tired of doing that or you're not sure what to do. It's totally up to you, sweetie. Oh, by the way, I do say things like, sweetie. I don't say it to my adult clients, thank you. But I do, it just came like I'm here. And I don't mean that I'm going to get written up. He called me sweetie and goodness. Yeah, she's trying to be five. It just came out because it's real, because it's genuine, because I feel that in that moment. Pumpkin head. And I did tossle a kid's, actually, I tossled the teen's hair yesterday. He came in. I mean, I couldn't help but this kid, and I've known him for years. He's wonderful, and we're real tight. And he's he just back from swimming practice. He's an incredible swimmer. And I went, oh my God, I got to do this. And I went, ah, to his hair. And he was laughing. And, you know, the little pumpkin has some little hair. Look at those shoes, man. Woo! Fly to the moon and back. So I'll make real comments about the real kid. Because I know they wore those shoes to show me. Look. Yeah, they'll fly to the moon and back. Those are unbelievable. Woo! You've got style and you want to show me. I'm glad you want to show me. So implying that she wants to show me, that's a kind of ideation feeling state. But I'm mirroring it. And if I'm wrong, you'll tell me, and you know it's safe to tell me. You're wrong. I'm, I, I've been wrong for the, at least three times in the last 31 minutes, I bet. Great lesson, by the way. It's okay to be wrong. And let me tell you this really quick. Sorry to be so tangential, but it's really important. So I got this buddy. He's a surf, I've learned, known him from, from surfing. He's a UCSD research guy. Big guy, big guy, big guy. 
He's, he's starting a new company, just got funded. He is working with mutating DNA and whatever's to cure everything from the common cold to cancer. And he's really on to something, apparently. I'm like, when are you going IPO? Because I'm all over that, dude. <laughs> he said, I said, God, but he talks about the three common, you know, all this stuff and what he's doing and how. I said, how the heck did you go to get to that? Because people have been working on this kind of stuff. It'll, it'll be customized medicine. So when your cold virus changes, it'll, they'll get a sample, they'll change it. They'll fix it and change math to that. So how'd you do it? He said, you know how? Because I didn't know what I was doing. I knew a lot about this, but I didn't know about that. So I tried a method nobody else knew anything about that would ever have done, because it would obviously be wrong. Guess what? It was right. So sometimes in not knowing and doing it wrong, you actually end up doing it right. That's a great lesson for all of us, especially for little pumpkins. Mm -hmm. So I'm really quick to say, I'm, I'm sorry, well, I got that one wrong. OK, tiny bit more. You, you're getting this, yes? By the way, it's never mind exhausting. It's also, on one hand, really easy, but susceptibly easy. Don't, feel, don't allow your inner critic in two weeks to come down on you. When you sit on this floor and you kind of look around and go, holy shit, well, this is hard. So what do you want to do? So uh, uh, you can play with this if you want. What, do you, what, what should this be? And you start asking questions. So you're liking that, huh? Liking that? I mean, you'll find the most brilliant ways to ask a question not asking it, but you really are. Because you're going to panic. Your amygdala is just like, oh, 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 oh. Sabertooth's coming down the pike now. Oh, my God. And they're thinking, what's most familiar? Asking questions. How old are you, anyway? Where do you go to school? What's your favorite class? What's your favorite college? Just talk to me, for God's sakes. I don't know what I'm doing up here. I'm dying. Yuck, yuck, until I'm yucky, and I'm going to be disconnected from everybody, and I'm going to be alone. Don't worry about that. But practice in the meantime. Okay, do a couple things more. And by the way, you have a great ability to shift in and out of things. You can go into magic mind, then thinking mind, back in. Very flexible. And that will serve you well also. Now, this little one, it's either a little girl or a little boy. So I say it's either a little girl or a little boy, because I really don't know. It might be useful. It's a little girl. It's a little girl. So I didn't ask the question. I just made the comment. She'll answer it. It's a little girl. I'm a little girl. Oh, here comes my pa, my pa. I want my pa. Ah. Oh, I get some too. Mm, 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 delicious! Very, very important that I said it was delicious. We'll get to that in the Carl tape. We'll talk about that. She didn't frame it. I did. With the trust that if it's not, she'll go, no, it's yucky. I go, oh, yucky! Oh, awful! Remember the thing about mommy's milk is sour, but mine is sweet? I tell you that one. I gave you that example. John Rosen. Mommy's milk is sour. When we get to, it'll come up on this. I'll tell you about it. Thank you. You're a giving person. Sometimes it's fun to give, and sometimes we want it for ourselves. Whoa! It's chocolate. I was wondering what that was. It's chocolate. Mmm, no wonder I loved it so. You're heating it all up. Yes, indeed. You know exactly what you want. Oh, thank you. Carrie. A little hot. You know what? I'm going to. Oh, I spilled a little. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. By the way, footnote you are never in trouble in here. There's nothing you could ever do to ever be in trouble in here. I want you to know that. I might not like something you're doing in any given moment. I might say, wait, stop. Oh, my gosh. But you're never in trouble. Just know that. That's a huge theme for kids. And they will look like, oh, God, did I do that? Am I in trouble now? You're never in trouble in here, ever. This is really different than any other place. School, home, any other place. Not that they're bad or anything. This is just different. It's your space. Anyway, let's turn. good thing this is brown. It's okay. 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 So I'm going to put this back here, I guess. Okay. Very good. Now you're going to give it to the doggy and you're cooling it off. You're very aware. They're eating chocolate. Mmm, yummy chocolate. Mm. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, thank you very much. I love that chocolate. That's really cool. You're being very sensitive to us. <sighs> We've got about 30 more seconds of time together, and then we have to stop. Mm. Okay. Here we go. Now you're going to cook up that one. Yeah. <sighs> mm -hmm. Now you're setting that up. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, you said something, Mr. Coffee. Coffee, of course. Cream. No, cream. Cream. No cream. Cream. Just the right amount. Delicious. Thank okay. you. Thank you. You take You're great welcome. joy in giving to others. And we need to stop. Thank you for sharing Magic Mind with me. Thank you. Hannah. Okay, thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions as you're watching all that. I want to put this back. It so easy. That's correct. <laughs> it's frightening. Yeah. <laughs> you're amygdala. And, and you got to, it's nuances. Well, again, I've been doing this a lot. How old are you? How old are you? 28. Yeah, I've been doing this before you were born. I was doing this. I've been doing this a long, long, long. It's automatic. I love it just as much now as I did then. I love it. It's a fabulous way of being in the world. But I, I'm, I've been doing this a long time. So the little subtleties, like I noticed that the thing tilted. So imagine it's really real. So it spilled. So now it's like, ooh. So it just, I didn't do that on purpose. You know, I didn't think, oh, no, I should spill it. Maybe. It just, ha you just, it's real. If you really move into magic mind, because that's what it was. It, you knew it wasn't real, but it felt as real as real. Because that's how you create reality. But you, again, I remember I told you, Play helps you realize that reality is really in the mind. So if you really go with that, and I told you when, when I was with that horse when I was five in Berkeley, and I felt like I was a Navajo on the plains of New Mexico. It was as real as real could get, even though I knew it really wasn't. So when I did that, I went, oh. And that captivates the kids, because they get it, that you get it, that you, because that is to them, it's like, oh yeah, that would be real, this is really real. You get it, this is really real, awesome. That's by Monique. Now I'm connected in this incredible adventure of sharing with you who I am in these little nuanced ways. I'm somebody who's making chocolate milk right now and it just spilled. And I have some thought and feeling about that. It's subtle, but it's profound. And that's why it's so important. It's important for you, and you will, for you to play like this with your little pumpkin. And for you, who else? Somebody else has some kids. Somebody has a little too much. Yes! You're going, to, you're going to do this with your little pumpkin. No, you already are. It really makes a difference. If we can get parents, I teach parents to do this. Never mind filial therapy, but just incorporate that. <laughs> so your thoughts and feelings, Ms. Child. Um, yeah, it's really. Hey, I, I, you just answered a lot of the questions I had. So okay. Doing with you. Okay. Like, okay, you're not asking questions. You're following me. Like, because. When I was practicing, I was kind of like giving activities for the kids to do, uh -huh. and then I would kind of back off, and then I would engage. But now I'm like, okay, oh, just completely let them leave. Because I'm not yes. really sure how much involvement to have or how yeah. much to step up. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am a more co-involving therapist than the traditionalist would be. Uh, you, when you see Gurney in the filial therapy tape. She's actually, I think it's just, it's hard for her to get on the floor. So she's actually sitting in a chair, and the kid's on the floor. And she's marvelously reflective, but she is not voicing for the characters, or so immersed in the immediacy of the play. The danger is that you're putting your stuff on to the kids. Again, the, the salvation of that is the kid will say, no, you're wrong, don't. No, that's the salvation. But there is that, you know, projectiveness of putting it on. I think it's, it, it's so magical for them to have you really join like that, that it's worth that. Okay, yes? Do you let the parents, or do the parents typically sit in and watch this so they can sort of learn this skill too, or do you really do it with the child alone? More often child alone, it depends. Oftentimes, like yesterday's first session with that girl, I had the, the parents kind of came in with her, and I said, yeah, come on in, because I do want them to do this with her. So I want them, and I told them that. They said, you know, I'm, I'm going to show you this. They're very smart people. And we've already, I've met with them once, two parents together, just the parents and I. They told me about what's going on. I tell them about my philosophies and approaches. I send them material. I sent them Stalick's book. Anything digital, I'll send them. Um, and I said, you know, why don't you come on in, and I want you to see what I'm doing. And I, and I talk about being a trade artist, and I kind of, a couple of times said, I'll, I was, I said some comment about how wonderful life is, and I said, I did that specifically because of those seven traits. I'm going to give them an article, seven traits. Zest. 
and she has it, and they want to underscore it. So yes, but more often than not, I end up seeing the child alone, so it gives them a very s sacred space that they really can't think, feel, say anything, particularly as they get older, six, seven, eight. In many ways, they want, really do want to have their own space. Okay, okay, getting this, getting this. Let's do this. I'm going to set up the Carl tape. Why don't we take a break now? Ten minutes, back at 9.55, and then we'll run through the Carl tape.